So, let's start. Um, first of all, I have to say that I am a bit shocked because this is a new tool. Um, and then I was given, you know, like uh, a slot in the first day of the cauldron and also in the big room, you know, and I was like, oh, yo, 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 I don't know if that is, this is going to end well. But uh, let's see what happens. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a bit about a program I have been working on during the last couple of weeks by myself because when I write a new program, I'd like to actually have something doing stuff before I, I start annoying other people about it. And it's called POKE. Um, and it is an extensible editor for structured binary data, or that is, that is what it's supposed to be. The GNU status has accepted pending is because I was unlucky enough to find a GNU evaluator who actually takes his job very seriously. But um, the, the, the process is in progress, and I hope that it will happen. So, this uh, stuff is work in progress. It works, at, at least to the point that where I wanted to reach first, which was as a proof of concept, right? Like it actually can do what I wanted it to do. Um, but uh, it is still not released. It is, of course, there is the Git repository available, but they have not released the first version yet, like officially. Um, and, but this is a lot of fun. I mean, I don't remember the last time I had that much fun hacking on something myself. So, the motivation, well, as with every tool, um, basically there was some itch I wanted to scratch. Well, in my case, it was stuff like this. Um, in my job, uh, I work on the tool chain, and, um, well, I find myself continuously in the need of uh, vandalizing object files in order to debug issues, for example, I don't know, in the linker, or, you know, stuff like that. So, with the years, I have been growing a private collection of uh, horrible scripts doing unspeakable things uh, on the, on elf objects you know and uh, libraries and uh, s records and what not doing things you know the way that we are looking you are seeing here in this slide well this approach of working obviously it has some uh, disadvantages which are <coughs> obvious right i mean you are relying on some specific behavior of in this case for example the bin utils and uh, um, those scripts are very specific, and also they break very easily, and also it's not fun, they are not fun to maintain. Um, so basically, back in 2017, uh, right before the cauldron that year, I thought, well, you know, I can't be bothered to upgrade my scripts any longer. So, I mean, I'm going to write, you know, some sort of binary editor that I can use to do stuff like this, like, for example, I don't know, changing relocations in an L file, Mm. And I'm going to make it like generic. And also I'm going to make it flexible enough so I can define the structure of the information I want to edit. And then I thought, well, it can't be that hard, right? Yeah. So, um, so I just started uh, hacking, you know, your usual personal binary editor, you know, in 2017. And this is what became a uh, poke. So, um, the initial idea was very easy. Right? I want to edit uh, structures that I can define, you know, in my binary objects. Um, but of course, you know, you all know that how this works. It started, you know, like, okay, let's take C structs. But C structs are actually very bad, you know, to define like physical layouts of data, as you all know. And uh, because so much stuff is undefined and there is padding, no padding, uh, alignment, not alignment, you know, it's a mess. But they thought, okay, let's get C structs, let's, let's add some additional annotations. And then let's work with that. Um, and that evolved during the months into a full-fledged programming language, domain-specific language, which is called POC2, but with big P. Um, um, and as usual happens too, I just started working on this from this initial idea. And then only after a couple of months, I uh, found by chance something similar called DataScript from Godmat back. Um, which was presented in a paper from 2010 or 11. And uh, he had more or less the same ideas. It was very interesting to, to see how independently, how could you find the same problems and you try to fix them in the, the same wrong way, but easy way, and then, you know. And, uh, but I got some good inspiration for it. There is also um, some existing similar thing 
It's called O10 Editor. It is proprietary. Do not use it. It is horrible. And, um, and also, it is very simplistic, and it fixes the problem in a, really silly, in a very silly way. Basically, it gives you a C interpreter, and as we shall see, it doesn't work very well. Um, and then, after many um, uh, blind alleys, you know, because many times I thought, okay, I got it right, but then at some point, you know, everything collapsed, and then I had to go back, and so on. I think I got it right, which is what I'm going to show you now. Um, this is how the program looks like, you know, at least the prompt. And here you see that it's, it, it, there is a dump command that gives you surprise, you know, a dump, a binary dump of the data. So, I am very brave and I'm going to do a demo. And uh, why? Because um, instead of telling you the characteristics on the language and everything and bore you to death, you know, and put you to sleep and then show it to you, I prefer to show it to you it first so you can see it working. And then I will bore you, you know, with the details. Um, what am we going to do right now with poke? I'm going to poke an L file to vandalize a relocation in the file. I'm going to change, I don't know, maybe the offset, the R info, or whatever, right? So let's get at it. Um, I'm going to run a not installed uh, poke. Oh, well, first we need an L file, right? Okay, um, this uh, L file, it has relocations, yeah, it should have, yeah, it has one relocation in this section for the each frame. So, let's poke it. Okay, I'm going to set the output base to decimal, by default is hexadecimal in my configuration script. I'm going to set the NDNS to little. Uh, by default, I think it's little too, but I, I, I'm not very sure of that. So, what can I do with this L file? Okay, you can dump it. And here this is, you know, like the... I'm going to split the screen so you have... Uh, so you can see it all. Or, well, yeah. Um, you can see there in the in the dump that well those are the bits and bytes you know i'm using a similar for the format that the emacs excel mode because i'm very familiar to that okay this is not impressive at all okay so i say that in poke you are able to define the structure of what you are editing how do you do that well you write some poke uh, code in files that i call pickles And for this, I wrote a little pickle, which is this elf.pk, which contains, which is 100 lines long uh, only. It's not a complete elf description, of course. And here, um, I describe things, for example, like the structure of an elf header, elf64 header. You can see it there. Well, you can see, you know, okay, first it has the E underscore ident, the magic number, and whatnot. All right. So. Uh, I should make Poke aware of this, so I'm going to load this pickle. And uh, let's start using them. Okay, let's map, let's see what is the integer at uh, the third byte in the file. You use this syntax. Okay, that is the value. Okay, what is the elf header at the zero byte offset of the file? It is this one. Okay, so as you can see, you can map an integer and you can map any type that you define as well. What happened if I try to map the elf header started at the first byte, you know, offset in the file? I get an exception, POC supports exceptions and catching them and everything, basically telling me that there is an integrity problem. How do you define integrity in this case? Well, if you look uh, at this field, the magic number, uh, after the fields in the struct definitions, you can specify constraints, which are unrestricted poke expressions, which can contain functional definitions, because we shall see that this is a statically scoped language, and so on, lexically scoped language, and so on. So, let's put it in a variable. All right, so now I can access, right, well, the header, 
for example, a type. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, of course I don't know how to use my own software, but that's right. And um, so we are in the hunting for a relocation. How can I access the relocations? Well, I need to find the the right section here, right? Where are the sections? Where the sections are in the in the elf header dot sh. Uh, um, where is it? Uh, sh num, yeah, at uh, sh off, right? So, this is the offset in bytes, uh, you know, of the section header table in the L file. And we see that we have 11, uh, 11 uh, uh, sections here. So, what I need uh, is somehow to get an array of relocations. How can I get an array of relocations? Well, you can also map, for example, this is the array of three integers that started at the beginning of the file, right? That you can put in a variable and access and modify and update. We will see more about this later. You can do it the same with relocations. So, for example, to get the array of all the entries in the section header table of this file, we will do it something like this. What do I want to map? I want to map and L64 is the uh, section header, which is defined by this struct here. So we will say, um, how many of them? Well, it is in the elf header, uh, E sh num. At what offset? It is also in the header. So this is the array containing all the section header uh, in this elf file. Right? Um, you can access any of those. So you see how basically you continue mapping the structures and then you can access them. Now, which one is the right uh, um, um, section here? Well, we could do it with a loop. We could do it, you know, you could write your little poke code to do that. But I happen to know that it is, in, I think, it's in the seventh. How can I make sure of that? by the name of the, of the section, right? If it is a rela section or by the flags. How do I get the name of, a, of an elf section, for example? Because the elf section seven, it has an entry which is sh name, but sh name, it is an offset in a string table in the elf file. This is the typical annoyances you know of elf, uh, you know, in this kind of formats. Um, well, I could get the strings table, I could look at it, the offset, you know, and all the dirty work that we all do all the time, or I can write a little function in my pickle that I can reuse like this. This is a poke function, basically that you give a, an elf header, then you provide an offset, and then you provide an optional string table, because as you know, the elf object can have a default string table, but maybe it, maybe you want to use a different string table because some sections in the L file might be using their own string tables. You know, it's this typical complexity. And if you look at the body of this function, it's doing its own mappings internally, and it is giving you a string. So you can use it to see, to get the name of the seventh. Oh! Okay, it is the same because, of course, I have this, done this before the, the presentation, yes. Okay, so this is our, our section containing the relocations we are interested in. Okay, let's go back to the pickle and let's see. This is what w how the description of one section. We have... Um, this works too? Yes? Okay. We have um, an SH offset which is an offset in the L file marking the beginning of the contents of the section, then uh, you have an SH size, which is a size of the contents of the section in bytes. In this case, not in relocations. Because why? Because the ELF sections are generic. All right. Um, so we need a mapping too. What is stored in a, in a relocation section? An array of relocations. And Yes, of course, I have a rela here. I have the definition of a rela. So I want to map an array of relocations at some offset. What is the offset? OK. Right? This is easy. How many relocations? 
Well, uh, yeah, we would need to divide, uh, you know, the, the total size of the section that they have in that field, in SH uh, uh, size, by the, by the amount, by how big a relocation is. In POC, that would be very easy, we'll show you later, but POC also supports to specify a size when you map arrays. So, for example, you can do this. And it gives us, okay, an array of one element in this case. So with this mapping, you are telling POC, oh, please, map the amounts of relocations that fit in this, in this specified space. We will see that if, if, if the space is not exactly the required one, it is less or it is more, you get an exception to integrity exception as well. So here is our relocation. Okay, so we put it in a variable. Well, this is an array, sorry. Okay, fine. Uh, and then we vandalize it. Uh, I don't know. Let's put an addend of 666. And we are done. We exit poke, and we are delight, we delight ourselves by uh, readelf minus r foo dot o. Yeah, you can see the addend that has been totally and completely uh, fucked up. Okay. Um, so this was the demo. Okay. This is the kind of stuff that you can do with poke. And I am doing this stuff with it already in my job, and it's saving me a lot of time. Also, it's super cool. So, the language itself. Um, the POC language is very straightforward, but it has a few very domain-specific goodies, some of which I am very proud of. Um, it supports values, like integers, uh, null-terminated strings, arrays, as you can see there, and then extract literals. The, the structs at the bottom are extract literals. I have to add the structs because of a syntactic word that will go away as soon as I, get, I can get a, a, a read of the JSON parser because I want to write a parser by, parser by hand once the syntax is stabilized. Anyway, typical, yeah? nothing. But then, I don't know if you have noticed in the demo that I was using so, some weird suffixes like uh, uh, hash, right, B or hash something, right, when I was talking about bytes. What, what is that? Well, when I was designing this stuff, I, I stamped into a problem that uh, also the data script author stamped, but he did not fix, but I did. But it took me a long time. Basically, when it comes to support to make a tool like this, one of the biggest decisions is, is my tool going to be byte-oriented or bit-oriented? Meaning, um, is my tool, uh, when you specify things like offsets and sizes to the to poke, and this kind of program is all about offsets and sizes, um, are you going to do it using bytes or bits? Of course, if you use bytes, um, it's going to be, you're going to make happy to 95% of the users, because it's very comfy to use bytes, but you will not be able to express certain formats and certain uh, stuff. Like, for example, the deflate algorithm, for example, format is bit-oriented, it's not byte-oriented. So then you will be forcing your users, your users to do byte masking, you know, and things like that, which is precisely what I want people to not have to do with POC, because for that you use C and you get done with it. Then you can say, okay, I want to be generalist, I, I use bit-oriented. Then you are basically making the life of 95% of your users very bad. Because, you know, you can imagine if you had to express every, every amount in bits, uh, then you should be, you know, you will be, you will go nuts, you know, multiplying, dividing and converting units. So then I found a solution and I have to credit Bruno Heibel because in one meeting we had in Frankfurt, in one of the rabbit heart uh, hacking weekends that we organize sometimes, we brainstormed about this and it was him who to came to the notion of let's use united values. So, basically, uh, usually, okay, you can have a pure magnitude, like uh, 23, which is 23, not 23 anything, 23 nothing. And then the offsets, basically, is a new first class uh, kind of value, which is a pure magnitude plus a unit. For example, the first value is 8 bits, the second 23 bytes, and the third is 2 kilobytes. Or kilobits, I don't remember, one of each. Uh, there you see, you see? But with POC, you don't have to remember in most cases. You will see how. Um, OK. Um, 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 POC understands you know, the unit part, uh, um, a few of uh, so those suffixes, like little b4 bits, big b4 bytes, and so on. But then I was like, OK, 
this should be more general. So you can also specify, like for example, you know, eight units of eight bits each, or two units of three bits each. So you can also specify a multiple of the basic unit, which is the bit for the unit. And then I thought, hmm, what if I want to express, to use as a unit, my own structs, right? So why not generalizing this so I can use, you know, like for example, here I'm defining a type which is a packet, some sort of packet, which is one integer and one long. It's four bytes and eight bytes. Why can't I talk in terms of 23 packets? Uh, so in POKE, for, for the structs whose uh, size can be determined at compi and compile time, which is not all of them, uh, but enough of them, then you can use them as units for your offsets as well. So you can operate in multiples of your own stuff, of relocations, of whatever. Um, and then, of course, well, there is a little algebra of offsets there, which is what you were suspecting. Offset plus offset equals an offset. Offset multiplied by, by an scalar is another offset. When you divide two offsets, you get an scalar, you get a pure magnitude, and the modulus, you get the offset, which is the remaining. Um, actually, um, this allows a, a little syntactic uh, trick, well, not trick. So this is, for example, 23, for example, left bar, uh, left type, packet, struct, int, y, long, l. And then, for example, you can say, okay, two packets. Okay, uh, you get weird units, but uh, it doesn't matter. Um, you can separate it like this, so you can put the magnitude and then the unit. How, how could I know how many bytes are, are in two packets? Well, you can divide two packets, but one byte. In POKE, the syntax, I allow that if the magnitude is one, you can omit it. And using some white spaces, you can get to something as nice as this. <laughs> Which is like when you are using, like, I don't know, kilos, grams, or whatever, right? Um, um, so in POKE, in POKE, you can actually do this, all these sort of unit conversions in this way. It's like if you were doing physics or something, right? With units. Um, yeah, so. Oh, sorry. Also, this has a big advantage in practice, which is let's just consider, for example, the session header of an L file. There is one field with it, which is sh underscore size. What is it? Well, it's the size of the section, but in which units? In bytes. Which means that if you write a C program or a Python program or in whatever program to edit this, you should keep in mind all the time that the unit of that offset is in bytes. So if you are operating in some other units, like for example in earth locations, you should remember that and you should manually compare the units before you write it back to the extract in, in the file or in memory or whatever. But poke, you, you don't need to do that. Poke can do it for you, as you can see there. So for example, here you are setting the size of this section as containing 10 elf 64 bits relocations, which is handy. Okay, so that's as for the values. Simple values, integers, then composed, arrays, extracts, whatever. And then types, okay. This is how, uh, POC support integral types. This is how you denote the types itself, where n can be from one bit to 63 bits, or 64, I don't remember, I think 64. Uh, I'm gonna expand it to infinite bits as soon as I can use, you know, the GNU uh, multi-precision library that is coming. Um, in POC, the, the integers, they do the right thing. I mean, you can use three bits integers or seven bits integers, you know, and it's perfectly okay. You can map them in, in the file, write, read, you know, it's comfy. Also, you have, of course, offset types, right, which are the one, they look like this. The in type is the base type, which is how with, you know, the field is, the offset field is, and then the unit, which is the important part. Hmm? You have seen it already in the elf pickle. Then there is the string type, which is just a string, only a type of this type. Then you have arrays. There are three kinds of arrays in POKE. What I call unbounded, as you can see, I don't support multidimensional arrays, but you can have arrays of arrays. Why I don't support multidimensional arrays is because in object files, you will not find them, basically. Or, okay, 
<laughs> Maybe you will, um, but unlikely. Um, then you have arrays types, like bounded by a number of elements, which can be constant, like two integers, or can be variable, like foo plus bar, foo plus foo and bar are variables, book variables. And as we saw in the demo already, you can actually bound an array type by size. Like, for example, it is an array of whatever number of integers that fit in eight bytes. In this case, two integers. All right? Um, we will see later that mapping an array, you know, the semantics is different depending on what, of if, it, if it is unbounded or bounded. And also, when you pass arrays as arguments to POC functions, it also does the right thing. Like, for example, if, you, if the type you specify in the function is a bounded array, constant bounded array, it does compile time checkings. If it is not bounded, it does uh, runtime checking, you know, to give you an exception if you overflow it or whatever. And uh, here we go, you know, this is like the heart of POC, the struct type. So, you can define simple stuff. Like, for example, in, in the first example, is a packet which is the structure in, in the file or in memory is first a magic number, which is a byte. Byte is a, an uint8, uh, I think, in the standard library, POC library. Then an unsigned integer of 32 bits follows, which is the data length. And then an array of bytes follows to that. And the size of the array is the data length, which is the field coming just before, which is data. So when you map this struct, like using the mapping operator we have seen, then POC will do the right thing. And we give you an array, you know, containing, you know, whatever value is in, you know, the size in data length. Here, the data length is an unsigned integer of 32 bits, which is common, but it could be 13 if the format is weird enough. Um, um, also, you can or you will, this is not working yet, the arguments in the structs, you will be able to pass arguments to the struct types. And a struct, the way it is implemented already, and a struct definition is sort of a, it, it is a closure, and it has its own lexical environment, which, by the way, is super fun because you can use stuff defined, you know, in outside blocks, and things get fun very fast. And um, so you can pass, you know, arguments to the, or you will be able to do that. This doesn't work yet. Also, um, you can specify labels, sort of, I call them labels because of, like in C, right? But uh, in a struct definition, by default, the fields, they come one after the other, right? So in this case, you have a, a magic number, which is a byte, and then immediately after comes a 32, an integer of 32 bits, and immediately after uh, comes an offset, which is an integer, or another form, and so on. But in some formats, for example, in ELF as well, you can have like holes in the structure, right? And uh, you define it using um, what I call a label in a struct. In this case, it is for the array data. You see the, the at, uh, at the end data offset that specifies that that array is starting at data offset. And data offset is itself an offset which is part of the struct in this case. But there, you can put any poke expression that evaluates to an offset value. Again, having offsets versus pure magnitudes helps here a lot. Because you can specify an offset, and if you specify an expression that evaluates to a pure magnitude, you get a compilation error, compile time error, which is nice. Because that means that you are mixing, I don't know, potatoes with oranges or something. Um, uh, this is the second syntax word that I will fix as soon as I get rid of the Python parser. Because I, the syntax I, I want is the expression, colon, and then the label, then the field definition, sorry. You know, like a sort of a C label, but go and try convince, you know, the, the Bison parser about that. You will not. Because I have, you know, like uh, ambiguities. So at the moment, I'm using this syntax. Also, in a struct, you can define it as pint. This is the equivalent to a C union. Because we shall see that POC has unions, but are not what you think they are. And this is the equivalent of a C union. For example, here you have... Uh, um, this is also from ELF. You have a struct which is um, um, an ST info, which is 32 bits, and then starting at the same offset, the composition of ST info itself, you know, which is ST bind and ST type, which one is 20, an integer of 22 bits, 
and the other one is an integer of, uh, of four bits. Okay? So it's one or the other, but you specify the one or the other, but when you define the struct as pinned, all the fields, they hang from the same offset. Let's say. It's the equivalent of a C union. Also, as we have seen, you can specify constraints. So you can write the field there, like the magic number, then you write colon, and then you can specify, you can write any uh, poke uh, uh, expression. Then this expression, if it fails, when you are mapping, you will get an error, a constraint exception, that you, by the way, you can catch the exception and do whatever you want with it. Hmm? I plan to add more types of expressions, but for the moment there is only, you know, all the const only the constraints one which uh, raises errors. And then the un union types. This is not completely implemented yet, but, and this is something, an idea I got from that script, from which, for which I am very, very grateful, by the way. Um, you have seen that when you define a struct in poke, basically you are, what you are doing behind the curtains is basically you are a sort of a specifying a sort of a decoding and encoding algorithm, right? But you do it in a sort of a declarative way and you let poke to infer that algorithm. Because poke is all about, you know, in the normal process of decoding, computing and encoding, uh, the idea is that you, ha you can focus on computing and you forget about the decoding and encoding. So, how do you do conditionals? Because in some formats, in many formats, uh, what comes next in the data stream it depends on, some, on something you have read already or something. You do it with POC unions. Um, so, for example, this is the extract of an ID3v2 frame, which are the little binary structures which are in MP3 files containing information about the author, the gender of the song, or whatever. The f each frame starts with an array of four bytes, the first of which cannot be zero. If it is zero, it's probably, you know, uh, uh, part of the, of the MPG stream or whatever. Um, then there is a size. And then what follows is it depends. Um, if the first... Uh, character of the ID, which is ID0, equals to T, in ID3v2, this contains sort of text-related data. Otherwise, the frame contains other data, and you have access to it as an array, you know, it's in the bottom line, frame data of, of, of size size, of, char of characters. But if the ID0 is T, then you have another um, conditional. If the size, which is a field uh, defined before, is bigger than one, then what follows there is a char with, whose value is zero, called ID as is uh, str, and then an array of size minus one, which is the frame data. Otherwise, you have an array which is the frame data of size size. Um, then you may be wondering, which alternative is chosen? Well, the algorithm is the following. Poke will choose always the first alternative for which there is not a violated constraint. Right? So, um, you may be wondering, it's not that redundant. You, know, you see this char size, okay, let's see. You may be wondering, is not this redundant to this? It looks like, right? But if you look at, at it carefully, you will see that not. Why? Because this is the data you have when the ID0 is not T, and this is the data that you have when ID0 is T and the size is bigger than one. You see? It takes a little bit, at least for me, because I am notoriously stupid, but uh, it, it, it took a little, bit, uh, a little bit of time for me, you know, to actually come in terms, you know, with the unions, but once you get used to this kind of logic, they are, they are super, super nice, actually. So this is for the unions. This is being implemented at the moment. So it works, but no. But yeah, but no. So, um, poke is statically typed. And I did that in purpose. So before any of you, oh, why you are not using Python or your favorite programming language, this is a domain-specific language for good reasons. And I remit you to the offsets thing, for example, right? Um, 
I made a poke statically typed for a reason, which is that for me, I think it is for an application like this, it's very important that the moment you look at a value, you should have a good idea about how that value is, will look when you map it into the IO space, you know, into the file or whatever. So if the code you write in poke to manipulate those values, they should have control on what a specific kind of value it operates on. So in that sense, poke is a bit annoying in the sense that when you write a function, you have to specify the type completely. But of course, I want to write a quick sort function and I want it to work in any kind of data and provide a comparator and things like that. I want to write sort of generic code because I am not a masochist. So what I did was the following. I added some sort of polymorphism support, which is I added an any type and an array of any type. It works, but it's not real. I mean, it works, but you know, it's really a poor man's type polymorphism. Because the way I made it working and safe is basically that everything coerces to any, but nothing coerces from it, right? So you can pass any's, any's to your functions, but as soon as you want a value back, you should have some other way to determine the type of it before you do a cast, you know, to get the value from any. It works. And I have been careful enough to um, make it in a way that it will be backwards compatible when I switch to gradual typing. When I gradual, gradually switch to gradual typing, all right? Gradu because I want to have a sort of a hierarchy of types. So for example, um, the first function here, which you can write in poke already, it uses complete types, right? Uh, for example, the first function, it gets assigned 32-bit um, uh, integer, another one, and returns another one. If you try to pass a 64-bit integer or an unsigned integer as an argument, you will get a compile time error. Okay, the second one, there is a typo. It's not, those are not ints, those are u ints, okay? Sorry about that. It's the same button sign. Okay, that is very efficient. Why? Because the compiler can do all the checks, the checking at compile time, and there are no runtime checks. But then, at the bottom, you have the any's. You have a function that gets any a, any b, and returns an any, which this also works already. But I, I'm going to add in the future something in the middle, using a notation similar to that. So you can specify partially defined types. Well, this is one of those things that seems to be easy, but this gradual typing thing is something evolving now, and uh, I can't stop reading papers. One claims they have it working, the other paper refutes that and says, no, you, you got, did not, don't have it working. I will see. Okay, I have variables, lexically scoped, block-oriented, nothing special here. Okay, the mapping thing that we have seen already, which is the central concept in POC, right? Because in POC, a POC variable, like def bar a equal 10, for example, or an array, um, it's in memory, right? But then the IO space that you are editing, I call IO space the file you are, being, you are editing, you can have values coming from that too. For example, uh, if, you, if you do this, this is an array of three numbers, of three integers, right? Fine. If you do this, B is also an array of three integers. So what is the difference between them? Well, the first one is a value that is a normal regular value that exists, let's say, in memory only, right? And you can access it, like A0, and you get the value. You can manipulate it, you can change it, no problem. The second one is a mapped array. So it looks like a normal array too. You can also, actually, you can also manipulate it, but when you alter it and when you read, there are side effects which is, you know, like what you do with it reflects in the file in this case. So what I wanted to achieve with POKE, which is the central concept of it, is that I want to be able to write code working on structs like ELF files or whatever, and that it will work in a mapped value or in a not mapped value transparently. And this is what took me a while to get it right. And it worked. That's why I am publishing this now, and I'm satisfied. Um, both can be manipulated in the same way. I have a quick sort. 
I can quick sort relocations in an L file and I can quick sort in, in, uh, integers in, in memory. You know, if you are curious, I am very fast, very quickly show you. What is my quick sort? Uh, that should be, yeah, this is a quick sort, the, quick, the poke quick sort implementation. You see you have there a type, a function type, which is the comparator, and then some, uh, well, this quick sort works for both file entities, entities in file and in memory, which was the original idea. Okay, we have seen it um, uh, already. To do a mapping, you do a type, to specify a type, then you use the map operator and you specify an offset. Uh, okay, mapping the simple types is simple enough. Mapping the extracts, we have seen already that it goes through the unions and everything. Um, ah, yes. Pointy, pointy stuff. How does it work? Ah, okay. Yes, but... Okay, it doesn't work. If you... But it is the arrays which are, you know, uh, a bit more tricky. When I started POC, I was convinced that I was going to have a very hard time with the extracts. Why? Because they can have fields, they have constraints and whatnot. It was the arrays, the real hard stuff here, and I had no idea until I found it. So what happens when you map an array? When you map an array that is bounded by a number of elements, you get the number of elements. You have seen that exactly right now, like this. Um, like three integers at that offset. You get an array of three, of three integers. What happens if there is an end of file condition? You get an exception. All right? Fair enough. What happens if you map an array and you are bounded by size? Well, the expected stuff, you know, I mean, you get an array, in this case, two elements as, uh, instead of three, because you have two integers in eight bytes, in this case. And what happens if you map an unbound? Well, what happens? Well, actually, I don't know if ho how big it's, okay. Um, uh. I have no shame. I, am, I will do it. I don't care what happens. Segmentation fault. Anyway, yeah, I think. <laughs> um, what happens when you map a, and well, this is because the file is big and I have some size problems somewhere, but it works actually. What happens when you map an array which is unbound? Um, basically, you get an array of the number of elements which are bounded by whatever happens first. End of file. So if you map an, an undeterminate number of integers, you get as much integer, integers until the end of the file. Or if there is some constraint failing, you know, in the decoding process, because it could be an array of elf something, or an array of your own structs. So if you tell Poke, um, give me, if you tell POC something like, like, give me all the packets starting at some offset, like that, basically what you, what, what you get is all the packets, so all the, an entry for everything that looks like a packet starting at that offset that doesn't make a constraint in the packet extract to fail. This is useful because sometimes binary formats are defined that way. So, for example, I don't know if it is in MPG or something, it is like, okay, now it comes frames. So, what is a frame? A frame is, is a 48 bytes block, uh, and the first four bytes should look like this. How many blocks I have? Oh, you know how many blocks you have, because at some point you will find something that doesn't look like a block. Instead of giving you an explicit size, basically, it, it is constraint uh, bounded, basically, bounded by constraints. And POC supports that out of the box straight away. That's why I made that. So now you recall the three different array types, right, in the, at the language level. And the, I support the three different uh, array types to make the mapping work, basically. Yeah. Anyway, mapping, very important. 
Now, well, the language, yeah, it supports functions, uh, supports for loops. I am still adding some control stru uh, uh, structures, you know, like I have to add more loops and stuff like that, but that's not important. That's boring, actually. You see that you define um, um, arguments, return type, uh, it supports uh, um, exceptions and whatnot. Yeah. Mm. It supports uh, optional argument. For example, in this case, STR tab is an optional argument, which, oh, I have to run, which is important uh, for something we will see in five minutes. Um, it supports variable length arguments too. So basically, if you have a, the last argument, it has a dot, dot, dot suffix. It has, can have any, any name. Well, it is an array of any's, you know, that was the main, the main reason why I introduced support for arrays of any's. Um, and you can see here that to access an any, you have to do a cast first, right? Like in this case, it's getting one of the arguments and it is casting it to an unsigned uh, integer of 64 bits. Um, yes, I like alcohol 68 very much. And uh, I, always, I, I always thought, well, if I make a function, a programming language with functions, I will have, you know, uh, the possibility of calling functions with no arguments, just specifying the name, which is a delicious thing that Algol 68 uh, provided. So in POC, it works too. Okay, this was the language. This was the language, the demo, so you, now you know what POC, what POC does. Now, how it works, and this is very fun, but I only have five minutes for it, and then another 10 minutes for something else. Um, well, it has this, it is this overall architecture. Right, you have a command line, which is, is the part of the program that prints the prompt and read line and the loop and the REPL and whatnot, boring. And then you have a compiler, which is super cute. You should go and see it, you will see. And, uh, and then you have a, the PVM, which is the POC virtual machine, which is a virtual machine that connects to the IO. The IO subsystem is the subsystem handling the, the file or the process or whatever you are editing. Note that the, you access the I.O. through the virtual machine, and this is important. The virtual machine has primitive instructions called pick and poke that actually, you know, uh, perform, you know, the update of the I.O. So, um, uh, the compiler, well, has a parser, uh, some uh, optimizations, code generation. I have a macro assembler, too. And then at the right, you can see I have in poke a, a VM command and this is the disassembly of a very simple expression. Please know that the expression itself is after the prologue and before the epilog, right? I mean, <laughs> for something like foo plus 10, you know, I mean, the real code is uh, the push bar, the push 10, and the other uh, instruction. It is a stack machine because, yes, I like a stack machines. And, um, and well, then that gets executed, right? If you are curious, very fast, 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 fast. If we look at the code generated for a, for, for a mapping, in this case, for a mapping of a simple type, this is VM disassembly, this expression, for example, int at, uh, at uh, 12 bytes. Then uh, you see that the... <laughs> there. The pick di, you see, that is the 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 code the, in the PVM that is executed to actually access the value of the integer from the IO space at some given offset. So all the IO is performed, you know, through the virtual machine. That's the idea. Of course, this is for an array, uh, for a for a for a for an integer. <laughs> if you specify, you know an array of three integers, well, the things change, you know? And actually, you see that there is a call of a closure because the size of an array compiles in internally into a closure. When you define a struct, it generates several closures with an encoder, decoder, with a mapper, with a re remapper, something called a ma val mapper, but those are internals, <laughs> which are fun, but... Uh, okay, so it's just a compiler. The compiler, it has its structure in passes and phases. I am very proud of my phases and passes system, by the way, because, well, if you are curious, go to the source code. 
it has analysis phases, transformation phase, constant folding, and code generation. Then I, I hacked myself a, a macro assembler, which is written because my own virtual machine is too limited for, for me. Again, I am notoriously stupid. So then I, I needed, you know, to have macro instructions in the code generator. I wanted to do it the right way, so I made myself a, a macro assembler. So in the code generator, I generate instructions like this. But this is a pain in the ass to update. So then I, I wrote something called RAS, which means the retarded poke, poke assembler. And RAS, which is written in AWK, basically allows you to write the um, poke assembler, like in a syntax like you can see here, and, um, and then it generates C for you. So the part of the compiler, which part of the code generator and the runtime libraries are written in assembler like this. I'm showing you this so you don't get discouraged, you know, with the previous slide to, to actually hack a poke. I mean, uh, then, okay, there is the POC virtual machine. It uses Jitter, which is, uh, Lucas, I use, um, it's a little infrastructure for making interpreters, and it works very well. Uh, it gives you, you know, you define the instructions and then the, the semantics of the instructions. Well, okay, the IO subsystem, of course. Um, um, basically, it is made in a way where the, the left is what the POC virtual machine sees, which is a space of I.O. objects. The I.O. objects are like integers of any number of bits, strings, uh, things like that. And then I have an, an abstraction layer that translates that into what they call the an space of bytes. So from a space of I.O. objects to a space of bytes. And then there you can hook very simple implementations of which is basically get C, put C, uh, tail and seek. Is this as simple as that? Um, so you can actually use POC to edit different things. Um, currently, I have one for files, but uh, you could, we could add one for processes, another one for, I don't know, DevK mem, I don't know, um, another one to talk with GDB, for example. Um, and of course, I have it planned, you know, to add support for cache, for transactions, you know, for IO callbacks, because at the moment, every time you access a math value, it is a bit gross at the moment because it do a remap, it does a remap. But what I want to do is to get, when you create a mapping, it registers into the IO space uh, uh, the range. So, hey, I am having, I am a value mapped, and I have uh, data in this range. So, if, if someone gets modified in that range, I want to be notified through this callback that executes some poke code. So then with that, I want actually to achieve, for example, the possibility of, of redimensioning arrays of things. And it's a house of cards, you know, but I think that POC is the good foundation for doing things like that. Okay, now, five, seven minutes. Um, hacking POC. Um, one of the problems I had is, like, okay, yes, I have a super cool, super nice POC language, but then I need to provide a command language, you know? Because I, don't, I did not want to go the Lisp way, which is a super programming language and a, an extremely horrible command language, you know? I mean, so there is a Lisp shell and a Lisp uh, uh, command language, and uh, it doesn't work. Because So, um, I found a way where you can actually mix both things, which is an alternative syntax for function invocation, which is the one that you see at the bottom. So there you have a function foo that gets three integers, one of which is optional. And then you can call it conventionally, like if you will call it in your program, like foo or parentheses, whatever. Or you can use that alternative syntax that allows you to call to specify the arguments by name. And actually, you can omit some of them if they are optional. So using this trick, oh, sorry, I can implement things like the dump command. So the dump command that they used before in the demo is actually written in POC itself. And uh, here you can see that the, the dump command, it gets options like from, the size, the group by, the ruler, the ASCII, and whatnot. And using this syntax trick, basically, I don't need any command language. And all you have to do to create a new command in POC is to write a POC function. And I think that it is comfortable enough. 
like for example the dump command you can specify like for example from um, I don't know dev bar y three integers at this offset oops dev bar and then you can say okay I want to dump you know from y offset size y size and gives you you know like the exact uh, contents of it for example I think it's quite uh, comfy you know this colon name of the argument which I borrow from common lisp obviously mm? so you can uh, expand the set of commands by writing poke functions and then the pickles which is what I mentioned before which is that you can create pk files and put collections of related stuff like for editing L files like for shuffling binary data around I don't know whatever testing I have a test suite and uh, it's growing especially now that the language is more or less stabilized so I can write tests with a little hope that I will not have to rewrite them you know like uh, next month what works the basic language works mapping works arrays works extracts works um, I only have to report four files the only command that is actually there is dump but it's very easy to expand it what I want to do before the first release is trust constructor well pattern matching search shuffling unions whatever and then in the future gradual typing support for sets organized pickle support for wider strings and other language improvements if you want to hack there is the there are the resources um, and then there is a file in the source tree which is called hacking which I took great pains to write and there you can find you know uh, some a little guide you know because some of the poke internals are complex um, and that's it any question that's, that's no. <laughs> Four minutes. Uh, a quick question. Um, can you do enums? Yes. Yes. The enums is one of the sets types that I want to support. I want to support enums and bit masks. Of course, yes, yes, it has a, a non-interactive mode too, which I use for the test suite. If we'll get you on tape. My question would be if you can generate binaries that do the script, just as Nick suggested. I mean, what I'm supposed to say now? Uh, I don't have a, 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 a native compiler for poke, no. How about using it in embedded uh, programs like uh, GDB? I mean, I find myself, I was going to gobble the gook and I want to interpret it. Can I do that? Or are you on the plans to do it? Link it with uh, GDB? I definitely want to do it, yes. Yes, but for that I need a good machine interface and I need to, I think that this IO space, Pedro is there looking at me like with no, uh, oh, he, he asked if I have plans to integrate poke to embed it in other applications like GDB, for example. Yes, I want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be a good parasite. Okay, I think, uh, sorry. I think we're, we're, the next talk's coming up in about 30 seconds. So yeah. um, thank you very much, Jose. Well, thanks to you. And thanks for um, giving me the right first up. slot in the conference.